live. Hello everybody, welcome to another Smile Shadower session. Uh, so sorry for the delay, um, we were having some technical difficulties, um, but today we have our very first forensic odontologist with us, Dr. Draft. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Draft, feel free to begin. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to always, I guess, share some of my passions of dentistry and the things I've learned along the way. Um, I like to you know, give you guys some really cool credit to, for setting up this type of a program because I know, you know, job shadowing is a, a big requirement getting into dental schools and also help expose people to different aspects of dentistry. Um, and we were talking a little bit before we went live here. I like doing interactive presentations. I love giving presentations to, you know, when there's people actually in front of you. And I know with the electronic, you know, media right now, what we're doing, it's kind of hard to do. Um, so if you are able to send in any you know, messages through the chat function, um, they will let me know any questions that come up. I and mean, I don't mind discussing some things as we go along the presentation If questions come up. If not, we certainly will have a question and answer session at the end of it as well, too, to answer any questions. So I definitely love to answer questions. So um, first, uh, you know, about me, as I get into here, I am a forensic odontologist, and I'll explain kind of more as we go along what that means. Um, but first of all, I know some of this is being recorded as well, too, but, you know, I ask that, you know, we, we don't take a lot of pictures. Some of the images here can be sensitive. Um, you know, think about, again, the content, forensic odontology, we're going to deal with death and some images, you know, that's certainly not always appropriate unless we be sharing around. So just, you know, please be smart about what you do with this presentation and just respect some of the images we have in here. So there's quite a bit areas where I'm involved. Um, one of my first, I guess, forensic jobs, if you would, as a career, um, was as at Kalamazoo County Medical Examiner's Office here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And so I've been working with them for a handful of years now doing cases. Um, they'll explain what it takes to kind of be a forensic dentist as we go along. But that's really has been kind of a big area. I've done a lot of work. Um, also been a part of what's called DMORT, which is the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team. And it's a federal team that responds to any disasters that happen within the United States. And I'll tell you one of the experiences I had towards the end of my presentation. Um, but if anything happens like a plane crash, you know, hurricanes, you know, if there's a big loss of life casualty wise, then they will call in DMORT and we're sent in there to do the identifications. I'm also part of MindMort, which is the Michigan, state of Michigan version of it. And so the way it's structured is most um, local things that they're happening at a small enough level, the, the Michigan state of Michigan team, MindMort will handle the event if it becomes larger than what the state of Michigan handle, then DMORG is called and it's kind of the backup. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. I got a lot of my um, training through the University of Texas um, San Antonio Health Science Center. And I did a fellowship there is a two year fellowship program I did through them. Um, and essentially we went down to Texas for long weekends every about six to eight weeks over the course of the two years as we learned more about forensic dentistry. Then through that process and the studying and doing a lot of casework, I became a diplomat in the American Board of Forensic Odontology. Did that about, about three years ago, I became a diplomat. And currently there are about 90 some board certified forensic odontologists that are active in the world. Um, a lot of them are in the United States, there are some that are worldwide as well too, and also into Canada. And in fact, my wife happens to be a board certified forensic dentist in Canada, uh, Corinne Danjou, and that's actually how we met. And so together she and I actually work at the, uh, the morgue actually in uh, Montreal, Canada. Kind of explain some more about that situation. We also are employed by Blake Emergency Services. There are a couple of uh, private organizations out there that also do respond to events, um, such as the Ethiopian airline crash that happened not too long ago. Uh, my wife was one of the forensic dentists that did a, a respond to that disaster. Um, so the same thing, you know, if there's something happens that's large enough, like in a lot of airline crashes that happen, they will call in Blake Emergency Services or um, Kenyon is one of the other companies that is a private company they'll call in to help with the gathering of the remains, identification and giving them back to their loved ones. Now, also in the past, I've taught at McGill University in Montreal, where we actually teach about another type of fellowship type of class where we do some hands-on training. You see some of the pictures here. We did bike mark exercises on uh, cadavers with pigs and some other experiences as well too. And then I have attended an uh, Interpol meeting. It's a, usually an annual meeting that happens um, that where they bring in a lot of different uh, people from different backgrounds, friends of odontology being the main one of this meeting where we come in and get to meet people from around, all over the country and share experiences. 
And just a little bit uh, of some of my life. This is my daughter, Ashley. Uh, and we actually do a lot of mission work as well, too, as dentists. Um, we won't talk about that. But, you know, as dentists, I think one of our you know, cool things is we can give back a lot of ways. And forensic dentistry is one way I give back to help you know, identify people. But also I can give back through mission trips and other things as well, too. And this was a mission trip that we did to uh, Kenya in Africa. And this is actually a picture of her with a lot of the people from the village that were helping out. This was in Western Kenya, um, out in the Savannah, you know, almost uh, way over in the far west side of the country. So just a beautiful country, beautiful people. You know, these people had never seen a dentist before, you know, so we have all portable equipment where we will take with us and set up basically a mobile dental clinic and be able to work there and help them out. Once again, my daughter there, Ashley, was some of the people that we were able to help. So some, some fun things we get to do. So another little, uh, I guess, disclaimer, you know, they talked about earlier, there are some pictures within this presentation that not everybody's always comfortable seeing. Um, they're not too bad, you know, I'm used to this stuff, but you know, if you, if the images of Linus here and uh, Charlie Brown, you know, bother you in the skeletonized form, then, you know, maybe it might not be good to continue watching this presentation. So just a, a little warning there. So what is forensic odontology? whole, I guess, wide range of areas that we work with. Uh, we do identifications, we do abuse cases, you see some evidence here, we do bite mark analysis, you know, so there's a lot of different things that we can utilize, you know, as far as our knowledge as, as dentists and apply it to forensic dentistry. And so the actual definition, though, is a scientific application of dental knowledge to criminal and civil law. And so there's a law component, component and a dentistry component. So we're kind of bringing those two together. So as dentists, we have a lot of knowledge, you know, as you guys will move forward in your career, you know, going through dental school and becoming dentists, you know, you'll find other ways if you're interested and, in, you know, helping to use this knowledge for different ways. You know, some people, you know, just love being a dentist, being in the office, you know, other people like to have other, you know, I guess, hobbies. And that's what we call this a lot. You know, for us, forensic dentistry is a hobby. Not a lot of people actually make a generous amount of money from it. But again, it's just another way to give back to people and, and help people out in their time of need. So one of the main things we do on a regular basis is the dental identification. Um, so I'm, to tell a bit more, I'm a forensic dentist here in the United States, and I'm also in Canada. So Kryn is a, a native of Canada. So I live mostly in Canada, in Montreal. And so I'm usually there about three weeks every month. And then I come here back to Michigan for one week out of the month. And so here I work for, again, Kalamazoo County. We do a couple of cases in the United States, it's actually kind of decentralized. So there is a medical examiner's office in Kalamazoo and some other bigger cities in Michigan. Whereas in Canada, the entire province of Canada sends all of their forensic cases down into Montreal. So when we go down to the morgue there, myself and Corinne are the two forensic dentists for the entire province of, Can of Quebec in Canada. And so we see a couple of cases actually every week there most often. But I say dental identification is probably the most common thing that, that we do on a regular basis. We also do dental age estimation and there are you know, various circumstances in which we use that. And I'll show a couple of examples in my presentation. Human abuse cases, you know, where we can help, you know, say was this child abused, you know, particularly you know, by teeth, bite marks, those kinds of things. Bite mark analysis, you know, so there's a bite mark, we're able to do some analysis sometimes and maybe help to point the police or investigators into the direction of who the suspect could be. Civil litigation. That a lot of times evolves malpractice you know, where we can be called in as expert witness in malpractice cases. And hopefully none of you, as you become dentists and move along your careers ever have to experience that, but it does happen. You know, sometimes, you know, dentists make mistakes or sometimes they do something they maybe shouldn't have or not qualified to do. And a patient suffers harm because of that. And then it goes to court. And again, we can be called in as expert witnesses in those cases, sometimes for the dentist and sometimes for the patient as well too, depending on the case. So the practice of forensic odontology, so most of us, you know, are employed in academics and military full-time clinical dental practice, and it's really just a hobby. You know, there's not too many people actually are employed as a full-time forensic dentist. Uh, Corinne and I are very fortunate, you know, that we do have, you know, every Friday we go into the morgue in Montreal and do cases, but again, that's kind of not the normal situation, especially in the United States. As I said earlier, most of it, you know, we just kind of do it on a, a very limited part-time basis when the need arises. Again, it's, it's part-time. If you do want to become you know, certified, and that's what, what we did. So it's through the American Board of Forensic Odontology. And this would be way down your career. You guys are just you know, looking into dentistry and becoming dental students to start with. So, um, but you know, you never know where your path might take you. So it is something that is uh, attainable after quite a bit of work. You know, approximately 90 of us that are out there right now. 
Some of the qualifications, just a broad general dentistry background, um, good head and neck anatomy. You know, these are all things you guys will learn as you get into school to become dentists. You know, radiographic anatomy, you know, be able to determine pathologies, looking at teeth. There's different things that we can use to analyze, um, you know, who might be, you know, a particular victim you know, and make sure the identification is correct. Looking at oral pathology. You know, restorative procedures. Um, you'll see some interesting things out there as you again, guys become dentists. Uh, you know, as you call it commonly a grill. Um, this is a you know. So if we had a victim like in a fire or some sort of accident, you know, we could use this information pretty easily to identify somebody. So we have to be able to pay attention to the detail. I think a, a lot of dentists are detail-oriented people. You know, we're working in mouths, we're working in small spaces, you know, fillings or measuring millimeters and stuff like that. You know, so really good paying attention to the detail. And, you know, I don't know if anybody, if you guys, I think you can see my cursor, but if you look at this, you know, x-ray here, you guys, you know, probably trained too much or seen too many x-rays, maybe some of you have had some expo experience. But if you look at this x-ray, you start seeing something's not right in this x-ray. There's uh, something that shouldn't be there. And as we zoom in on it, we actually can see this. You see it's about the throat area right there. And as being an experienced dentist, I can tell this is what we call a Maryland type of bridge. So this would be actually the fake tooth part of it. And then there's two wings that are glued onto the adjacent teeth to replace a tooth for somebody. And here's the actual picture of it. So here are the fake tooth and the wings that are glued onto the adjacent teeth. So if you, you know, first glance back at the original x-ray, you might not catch that at, at first, but when you look at it more detail, you can see there's a, a vital piece of information that's contained in the x-ray that may explain why this person could be deceased if that's the case. So what are some of the methods we do of identification? You know, a lot of times visual can be done, you know, if the remains are in good shape, you know, they will do that and they'll compare it to photographs of the known person. Fingerprints are very commonly used. I say they're more commonly used here in the United States because a lot of people are already in the, the database, you know, for their fingerprints. Personal effects, you know, they have driver's license on them, you know, maybe clothing with their name on it and all kinds of things that can lead you in the direction of who the, the victim might be. Identifying marks, and it's kind of interesting one here. This is what you normally see, we call a Y incision, and we do an autopsy, but this is in fact a tattoo. So, the, you know, if you take a quick, quick glance at that, you might not realize that, but that's a tattoo, and so is this tattoo here. But again, very unique identifiers that we can use to help identify somebody. So if you knew the person was alive, had pictures of them, and we had pictures of these tattoos, we can compare it to the remains in the morgue and see if it was a match. Sometimes association exclusion, you know, were they with certain people, were they not there, were they in a car, were they supposed to be? And then also dental medical findings where we come into play. You know, so we can look at teeth, we can look at restorations. You can see the pictures here, this is a tooth color filling. We'll use different light sources, sometimes UV light to help to make uh, fillings show up a little bit better. So we'll see those in the morgue. And also the maxillary or the frontal sinuses here, you see are actually unique. They're almost like a fingerprint. So we can compare those as well for identification. But of, and then DNA, finally DNA is also used and that's more readily used now. It's becoming cheaper and they actually can do DNA analysis faster. But of these different methods, there's only three of them that are actually continue, considered a legally valid scientific identification. And that is important. You'll see here in a little bit and why we sometimes need those identifications. So this is one of those pictures that not always, you know, people stomach the best, but, you know, so if you see these remains and so the picture that's on the left, you know, look at the face, you can see a little bit of hair, you know, you know, maybe you could visually identify this person, you know, not the best, but, you know, the middle person, we've got some more decomposition that has happened. You see some maggot infestation. And on the picture on the right, we have a burn victim, you know, so therefore you can see those, the middle and the right one, definitely not, you know, visually identifiable. But if you look at the teeth, the teeth are in great shape. You know, they have withstood whatever has happened to these remains. And so we can take x-rays, we look at these teeth and we can use them as identification, you know, very rapidly. So our role again is, you know, dental identifications. Here's another case of burn victim. You know, so what we'll do sometimes when the victim is burned, the tissue is very tight. And so it's hard to get the mouth open up. So you'll see here where we will do incisions to actually expose the, the cheeks um, and get the teeth there. And then if you zoom in a little bit, here's another case of a grill from this victim. So you see some pretty fancy work, you know, some diamonds and the gold up there and on the bottom, you know, so if you knew a victim, you know, that had this work before, it can be pretty easy identification based on just that work. 
And this is a case that happened um, quite some time ago now. It's a case we talk about a lot. Uh, actually happened really close to us here in Michigan. There was a van full of students. They were traveling to a school event. The van unfortunately got into an accident. And in that accident, some of the victims in the accident survived and some died. But in the rush of getting the live victims out, you know, they grabbed the, some of the people out of the van and they grabbed the identification and by those people. And you might get where I'm going with this. So there was a misidentification. So these two young ladies, you know, as you can see in the pictures, very similar. You know, the hair is similar, facial features similar. You know, so in an accident where there's trauma to the, the victims, you might not at first glance be able to tell who is who. And what wound up happening is one of the young ladies actually perished in the accident. The other one was taken to a hospital, but was in a coma. And so the one family who thought their loved one was dead in the van was in fact, their loved one was alive in the hospital and vice versa for the other. So you imagine these families, one family thought their daughter was dead. They're grieving her to come to find out a couple of days later that in fact, their daughter was alive. And then what about the family who thought their daughter was alive and now learns that their daughter was in fact dead. And so it just was a misidentification at the accident scene. So no scientific identification was done. And now you've put the, these families through extra trauma because of that. Um, so here's a little bit of information about it. You know, so had they just taken the time to verify the identity, you know, it could have been dental or other means, you know, this wouldn't have happened. So in a very sad situation. Um, and then the picture here, the little article on the upper right, and you can see this was a, a case where a coroner mistakenly identified a um, rabbit, basically rabbit bones as a, as a baby. And so that was pretty, again, another mistaken identity, pretty, pretty bad one there as well, too. So these are things we try and help prevent against, you know, in the career that we do with the forensic dentistry. And see, get that to go, there we go. So in Michigan, we actually have a law and most states I think have a very similar law to this where a scientific identification is required when a body cannot be visually identified due to thermal damage, trauma, decomposition. And that accident does occur where two people die or one person dies and others hospitalized and the victims are the same kind of ethnicity and a scientific identification is required. You know, and so that's some of the cases that we do have had several car accidents where both victims, again, I had one that were two young girls that died in a car accident, very similar you know, shape and build. And then we had to do the scientific identification to make sure we had the correct remains. This is a case that happened in Canada. Um, my wife was not involved with this. She actually helped to kind of sort out some of the, the mistakes that did happen. Um, it was a similar situation where they had a, a bus full of hockey players and the hockey players got into it. The bus got into an accident. Some of the hockey players were killed in an accident, some survived. And there were some quick identifications done. Um, and I think I have a video here that will play, give a little bit of background of that. Let's see, guess, let me know if you hear the audio. How did it happen? Two large vehicles collided the on a clear day. The yeah. bus carrying the Humboldt Broncos was northbound on Highway 35 headed to Nipawin. The tractor trailer loaded with peat moss was westbound on Highway 335 en route to Alberta. They reached the highway intersection at precisely the same split second. The heavy tractor trailer's momentum appears to have driven the impact west and north of the intersection. The bus appears to have had the right of way, the tractor trailer a stop sign. The truck driver, not badly injured, was questioned by police. Whether there was driver error or mechanical problems will be determined by an investigation, which will look at speed, braking, and other data from the vehicles. Police are not saying whether charges are pending. So yeah, another very track is the accident, and there were some you know circumstances that kind of brought about. Let me go back to the next one. Let me see that again. Sorry. There we go. So yeah, same error, another, another tragedy, you know, and so we had, here's just, you know, two young men, you know, again, very similar in build, you know, haircut. And the other thing that happened is they all had colored their hair for this particular event. So they all had the same color hair. It looks like kind of like a yellow color um, that they had. So again, they were very quick to make the identifications, but unfortunately they got some mixed up. And I think my next slide shows yeah, here we go. The actual corner talking. Heart break in Humboldt, Canada, magnified by a government mix-up. 18-year-old junior hockey player Xavier LaBelle, who was thought to be dead, survived, mistaken for teammate Parker Tobin, who did not. And I want to apologize to both of those families on behalf of the Office of the Chief Coroner. A lot of these boys looked alike. They had the blonde hair that was supportive of their team and for their playoff run. They're very similar builds. 
Xavier's house mother tweeted goodbye to him and two teammates who lived in her home before learning of the error. Her other house sons, Adam Harold, who would have turned 17 on Thursday, and 18-year-old Logan Hunter died in the crash. In all, 10 of the 15 fatalities were players aged 16 to 21. You know, so in these instances, there's a lot of pressure sometimes on the coroner and the people involved to make identifications because they want to get the remains back to the family and help bring closure. But again, if it's done too quickly and you don't do a scientific identification, these mistakes can be made and it causes you know, a lot more harm than actually good that you're doing. So, you know, very important for us to take a break and kind of slow down and to make sure that we're doing things correctly. So I'll kind of take back a step a little bit. Um, if you guys know much about history of dentistry, but Paul Revere was actually a dentist and a silversmith. So you know, a lot of the earlier fillings were made out of silver and different metals they made. So he was a, did some dentistry work as well. And there's actually was a doctor who was, was killed and needed to be identified. And he was able to actually identify this doctor because he replaced a tooth with a walrus tusk. So he's able to say, hey, that was my work and I knew who I did that on. And also using our forensic eye, depending on the quality of your screens and what you can see, if you look at this skull, there's some additional information that we can look at if you look closely. I need to give you a little second to look, but there's actually holes in the skull. You know, so you can see, you know, there's a hole here going, you know, underneath the, the left eye. And then there's a hole here on the back side of the skull. And so more likely this person was a victim of a gunshot, probably a musket shot back in that time of the year. Uh, sorry, time, you know, back in the, in the time of history. You know, so this would more likely be the entrance wound because usually the entrance wound is a smaller as it goes into the skull. And as it comes out the back side, this would be the exit wound. So got, you know, a bullet right underneath the, the left orbit. So what are some of the advantages of us doing dental identifications? It's cost effective. Um, it's very quick for us to be able to do identification. It doesn't take a lot of effort and work. A lot of times we can do it if we have the records pretty quickly. Compared to other methods, uh, DNA is expensive and takes time. Um, that's becoming a little outdated. Again, it's not as expensive, still you know, relatively expensive compared to us doing identification. And there are some labs that can do DNA because of the advances in technology. They can get you know, results back within 24 hours sometimes if it's a high profile case. Otherwise, there's a lot of times a backlog of cases. So again, if it's one that needs to be done quickly, they can do that. But it's really a lot easier and quicker for us to be able to do it with the dental means. Um, fingerprints also cost effective, um, pretty quick and easy, you know, if the remains allow it. That's the other issue. If you have decomposition or fire, you know, the fingerprints aren't there anymore. And so they're not always in the system either. Visual, as we mentioned, is not very reliable. You, know, you can't always rely on that. And teeth are resilient, you know, so they can survive extreme circumstances. And there's a lot of things that teeth will survive fire. So we saw a little fire case earlier, but here's another one, you know, see, you know, pretty probably extended fire for the remains to be burned to this degree. But what happens is the, the tissue, of the teeth, again, it becomes very, very tight and protective. So it'll tighten up around the teeth. So, you know, here in the picture on the right, we've done an excision to expose the teeth, but where the front lip is a little thinner, you know, that will burn away if the fire is long enough and sometimes will affect the front teeth. But we have these teeth in the back are still in very good shape. You know, so we have a lot of good information that we can use here for a potential identification. The teeth survived trauma. This is a, an example of remains taken from, I think it's the German Air Wings airplane crash. Um, so we have a high velocity incident like that. A lot of times the remains are you know, broken up you know, into small pieces. And you know, if remains are found with teeth, we certainly can use those teeth as identification. You know, other pieces of remains that don't have teeth, you know, a lot of times they'll do DNA to analyze those. But here in this case, we've got some good teeth and again, x-rays and some visual examination and we could use that for identification. Chemicals, you know, we've had, you know, murder situations where they try and get rid of the body with various chemicals, you know, and eventually the teeth could dissolve given enough time, but um, they will survive actually quite well for quite a period of time. Uh, teeth are unique. Okay? Much like fingerprints, you know, there are a lot of different combinations for teeth that can be unique. And so I think my printer, my dad's printer is probably printing there something, sorry. And so um, the fillings, you know, so we look at fillings, we can, you know, look at the fillings of these teeth and no two fillings are ever going to be exactly the same. There are unique characteristics to those fillings that we can look at as far as comparison visually and also radiographically. Um, there are crowns, you know, so crowns go on to teeth that have had root canals or bigger fillings. 
Again, they are all unique and individual. And so you might see, you know, a gold crown versus a porcelain crown. You'll see different shapes and different anatomies of those as they show up again on the x-rays as we look to compare. Teeth can have root canals. And again, you know, information here. So we look at the shape of these roots and these teeth and they have this crown and this filling. That's all going to be unique to this tooth. And it's very hard to have another tooth and another individual that's going to look exactly the same as this. So we have a lot of morphology to the teeth and the roots. And so look at this tooth here with this crooked root, you know, very unique. Again, more than likely not gonna have the exact same bend or shape or angle as you would in another individual. You have the sinuses, you know, the, the floor of the maxillary sinuses will give us a shape here. So in this x-ray, we've got a root canal. That's what that looks like. We've got the sinus, we've got fillings, you know, we have all kinds of information that we can use to make identification. Even bone patterns. I've had a lot of cases where younger individuals are people with no fillings, you know, and we look at the teeth, we look at these bone patterns, you know, these little patterns here between the teeth, you know, so that's all again, pretty unique and individual. So if we kind of put all that information together and we run the numbers, so we say a, a tooth can be present or missing five surfaces to each tooth. Okay. And again, these are the things you guys will learn more about as you go along your career and we have 32 teeth. So if you crunch those numbers, that means there's seven to the 32nd possible combinations or that number. Yeah, I don't think I could say what the actual number is, but that's a lot of combinations. You know, so if you look at that overall, the human population, you know, it's gonna be pretty unique what we can see in the teeth. So when we do comparisons, we look at records. Um, so we have the anti-mortem, which is what is obtained from the dentist. So those are the records when the person was still alive. And we have the post-mortem, which are the records from the morgue that we take, you know, uh, the remains in the morgue. And so if you were to look at these two x-rays, so again, the ones on the left are when the person was alive, the one on the right is from the morgue, and to try and do a comparison. And again, these are things you will kind of look and see as you learn, you know, so these are crowns here in the bottom, right? And this is a crown up here as well, too, different type of crown. These are silver fillings, more crowns here, more silver fillings. And so if you logically kind of look at this x-ray and think about it and I'll explain it more because you guys are getting, it's not, I'll probably always have all this knowledge yet, but this is a wisdom tooth. Okay. So these are the, this is the six-year molar, the 12-year molar. So here's a six-year molar and a 12-year molar, but there's no wisdom tooth here. So if the person when they were alive had no wisdom tooth and now the person is in the morgue has a wisdom tooth, that's not a possibility. You can't grow your wisdom teeth back. Nor can you go from a tooth with a bigger filling, a crown, to teeth with smaller fillings. You can't go backwards. Okay? So basically, if you look at these two x-rays, you can pretty quickly tell that this is not the same person. Okay, So this one would be excluded as a, an identification. So we say, nope, not identification. But if we look at the next one, so it's the same antemortem records. Now we look at the postmortem, and this is an actual one of my cases. So this is the x-rays we took in the morgue. There's been some trauma to the victim. So we have a tooth that's missing here, which you'll see sometimes depending on what happens, um, you know, whether it be an accident or I've had, you know, suicides where they, you know, use a gun against their head. And, you know, we see a lot of trauma and damage to the teeth and the jaws, but we can still find fragments and compare it with. So in this case here, you know, now you look at the x-rays, so you look at these crown, these bottom teeth, you know, they're shaped pretty much the same. You know, it depends on the x-ray angle. You can get a little bit of variation, but they're pretty the same. But look at the filling up top. Look at the shape here, how it kind of dips up and down and how this little end here, the box. And look at the filling over here. You know, same thing. Okay, again, not 100% identical because of the angle of the x-rays we see a little differently. But look at the crown. Look at the shape of this type of this crown here. You know, where we've got just the different materials. Yeah, you know, I know we're missing the teeth here, but same thing, look at the filling, look at the shape of that filling. You know, so now we compare these two and this in fact was an identification. So it kind of gets some idea of how we use our dental knowledge and our knowledge of fillings and the shape of things to be able to make a comparison. So that was the actual identification. Yeah. So dental age assessment, uh, we have various reasons where we do age assessment on cases. Um, one that's common is immigration. So if we have somebody who immigrates into this country, either illegally or illegally, you know, depending on their age, they receive benefits. Um, you know, if they're a child, they receive different you know, benefits of an adult. Uh, if they came in illegally, the adults are sent back. If they're a child, then they're, you know, given over their opportunities. 
Um, certainly it's a, a big area of discussion, of, you know, amongst you know, probably people politically these days, but, you know, we can lend our hand in these cases. So a lot of times we want to determine if the individual is 18 years or older. And what we do at that point is we look at wisdom teeth. We can look at how far along the growth of wisdom teeth are. And we have data. We have studies that have data tables and there's different programs that have been written. So we can look at these teeth. We can we say we stage them. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So we stage these teeth and we can plug it in the program and we can come up with a probability of how old that person is 18 or not, a probability. Also helped identify unknown victims where you estimate their age. Now again, I'll show you a case here in a little bit where we use age estimation in the case. And we can differentiate between clusters of victims. You know, so we have you know adults and childs and a, and a victim in a situation, or sometimes even people a bit closer. We can determine how old they were and try and help differentiate who was who. And in criminal cases, you know, if they need to be trialed as a juvenile or adult, they may be lying. You know, sometimes it's of course be in the in the suspect's benefit to lie to make themselves younger. And we can look at the teeth and try and help determine how old they really are. So how do we do it? So teeth have known developmental stages. I mean, this is stuff that you guys will learn once you're in school. So we have just the beginning stages and we go through these and we call them like a bud, cap and bell or some of the things we call them, but as the teeth kind of grow, mature and erupt and come into the jawbone. So these stages happen at a pretty well-defined moment in our life. There is some variation, there's genetic variation, there's that ethnic variation, but overall we know that happens on a pretty well-established timeline. And so the teeth age as well too. So if you look at the picture, you know, here, and I think even, you know, people don't have a lot of dental experience, you can look at those teeth and realize that it's probably a person a little bit older. You know, definitely not in their teens or 20s or even 30s, or probably more in their 50s or 60s or so. So that what happens to these teeth? Other things happen to the teeth as they age that we can also can quantify and help to use as an age estimation technique. There's charts out there. There's dental charts that show eruption. Um, Alcatani made this chart, um, a very bright individual I know actually quite well, developed this chart you know, several years ago. So we use that as a source of comparison to determine how old somebody are. And there also are other staging charts. These are staging charts that I help um, to develop through some of the research and studying that I've done. They're based on prior work from Dr. Demirjian. So Dr. Demirjian was a, a dentist who did the, a study back in 1976 who developed the staging protocol. And we essentially just in the last couple of years um, modified them and made them um, you know, using digital x-rays and better diagrams and descriptors. And so what Demirjian did in his study, and so you take an x-ray of the individual and we talk about these stages. So you see different teeth and different stages of development and we apply the stage to them. So we have a chart to compare to. So if you look at the teeth, and I'll just kind of go through this quickly because yeah, maybe some of you know a little bit of tooth numbers, but we have the premolars and then the molars. And so we essentially look at the tooth and we look at the chart and see, you know, well, what stage is that tooth at? And so if you're looking at this second molar here as an example, Okay, we go over here in the chart and say that's pretty close to this stage. So we say that's a stage C. So we do that for all the teeth that we have available, come up with these stages, and then we can take that information and we go to a data table. And in this particular study, we calculate what's called a maturity score. So each of those stages, okay, that we took for the tooth and go over to this stage, then we have a number here that we get. And so we kind of go through those four teeth that we staged and we pull the four numbers off. And in this study, what we do is we add those up to a total of 52. Then we go to another, in this case, it's a graph. And so we take that information and we plug it into the graph and we look at it. And what we get out of this is actually an age, an estimated, and so it's an estimated age. So in this case, the maturity score is 52. So we go across the graph and we look at that and we can go down to where the age is, okay? And so for this case, it tells us that the age was estimated to be 6.6 .6 years old. And there's some other science in here that I teach when we do more, you know, in depth, you know, studying for forensic dentistry, but basically this has given us an age and it'll give us a range of an age, you know, so what range can we expect somebody to be? Cause we can't say precisely what age the person is, but we're gonna give you an estimate and then an age range that they might be, right? And part of also the studying the work I did, I created spreadsheets. So that's a little bit of work to look at the old study, do the numbers and calculations. So actually I made a spreadsheet that does the calculations for the, for the users. That's one of the things that I've done. Right. 
And actually, this is Dr. Demirjian. He's still alive. Um, he actually is uh, in living in Montreal. And this is my beautiful wife, Corinne. And so she and I actually, I think when I fly flying back to Canada on Friday, uh, we're going to go have, I think, have a meeting with him Friday night. So he's still doing alive and well and a very, very interesting uh, individual who has a pretty cool career. So this is an example of us using age estimation in an unfortunate um, accident that happened here in Michigan, actually Kalamazoo area back in 2018. There was a fire in a hotel and it, unfortunately eight people were staying, a family of eight was on the second floor and a mother and her five children died in the fire. Um, the father was able to visually confirm the children, but because of the circumstances and the laws of Michigan, we had to do a scientific identification. And what had happened is there was a fire in the apartment down here where the, the person was using a hot plate to cook some food, caught the room on fire and the family was staying in the unit above and all the smoke went up there and they died from smoke inhalation. And I will skip that one, that video there. So this was actual picture from the fire. And so here's the mother and probably two of the children. And you can see the outline of their bodies from the smoke. You know, there occurred in that hallway where they succumbed to that. So the mother was easily identified. Of course, you know, you could separate her just looking at age, but the five children, you know, you can see there's a range of age here, but some are kind of close. And we needed to make sure that we knew which child was which proper scientific identification. So the, the problem with DNA in this case, it's, it's a closed population, but they have all the same mother, of course, and mitochondrial DNA could not be used. And so, the, and also the fire destroyed other possessions, but because they were all male and they're all related to the same mom, because the DNA analysis they usually do, that was not gonna be very effective for us. So it, it, it could be done with a lot more work, but it wasn't gonna be effective to take time. So for us, it was kind of easy to do as far as the age goes with the teeth. Some of the kids had been to doctors and they did have some imaging. So you can see here, just like we showed you with the teeth, we can use it with other parts of the body because the shapes of bones and everything are unique as well. And so the anthropologist did take some x-rays and compared, you know, the, the structure of the feet and the shape of the feet. So they look at those things as well for identification. Okay, and there you go, just highlighting some of those. And another child, same thing. You can see where they had the antemortem and then the postmortem x-rays to be able to look at the different areas of the feet. And this is where we came in. So Corinne actually was, was with me in Michigan when this happened. And so we went down to the morgue the next morning and the medical examiner called us in and we did the dental autopsy on the victims. And as we took the x-rays, we actually plugged the staging as I showed you into the spreadsheets that I built. So at the end of each autopsy, we were able to come up with an age estimation for each of the individuals. So for instance, you see here where my spreadsheet shows the average age of 2.2. Okay, and it shows you the age range. You see, sorry, the average mean age was 2.5, sorry, with the age range of 2.2 to 1.9. So that's the age range. Okay, the real age of this person is actually 2.72. So you see, we were really close to the actual age, but doing that through all the victims, we're able to segregate the victims based on their age. So within, I think it's about three, three and a half, four hours, we actually did all the dental autopsies and, and pretty much were able to tell the medical examiner which child was which just based on their age estimation. Okay. And so we also did take x-rays. Of course, that's how we look at the stages. You can see here all the stages. I mean, two of the kids I think had been to a dentist, had some treatment, so we were able to compare, but because the teeth grow and the teeth change, you can't always do a direct comparison, nor do they always have any fillings. You know, so you could try and extrapolate some comparisons on these x-rays, but it's kind of hard to do because some time has elapsed and the teeth are growing. But again, some of them did have restorations. There was a chart from the dentist, so we could look at the restorations and use that as a verification of the identification. So again, we use, this as one of the other victims where we use the spreadsheets. So there we saw the, the result was 6.1 and the actual age was 5.93. So again, you can see how close we were in our identification as far as the analysis goes. And I'll just kind of pop through these kind of quickly just to show you the different examples. We use the, the charts as well. You know, we use every piece of information that we can to help make sure we're doing a good analysis and a good assessment. Another child with some x-rays. So going through the case, we were able to identify majority of the victims either through medical imaging, through the age estimation that we did. But we did have at the end, there was one child that we didn't have any further information on. as one that I think one of the youngest child because she hadn't been to the doctor, hadn't been to the dentist. And so what we essentially did here, you can see example of fillings, okay? 
So if you look in the mouth, it's hard to see the tooth color filling, but we use a UV light and actually they will fluoresce. And so we can see the fillings better that way. So I can just kind of pop through these cases a little bit. And this one was 10.4 and 10.4. So our analysis you know, was right on for that particular victim in comparison there. Another victim here, child four, you can see again the anti-mortem x-rays and post-mortem x-rays and some fillings you can see okay, where we did that comparison. And same thing, just kind of popping through those a little bit. Child number three, again, this presentation is, you know, you do a lot more talking with, uh, you know, other people that are in forensic dentistry, but just give you a quick example. This one was showing five and the actual real age is 4.69. Okay. And just some of the comparisons there with the chart. So the, the third, we consider the third child, but actually was kind of the, the child at the end here. So reported age was four years old. You know, the estimation of dental age, we used three different methods. They all agreed. And we had no other way to compare. We had no medical x-rays, no dental x-rays. So this was a case of exclusion, basically. So the medical examiner was able to say that it was a closed population. And that meant a lot to us. So she felt comfortable enough saying, you know, there weren't any friends sleeping over, you know, that all the children were accounted for. So we know this entire family was together in this fire. So because we scientifically identified the other children, just by basis of exclusion, this was the only child we had no other way to really identify but we were able to determine the age of the child that they did do identification on that child just based on the age estimation. So again, yeah, that was where our, our role was very important in doing the identification of these children. So again, there's that picture and just so we were able to identify them all. So again, you hate to see it happen, but you know, we can really play a, a pretty vital role in these circumstances when they do happen. So sometimes we also deal with abuse, kind of moving on to you know, another topic here. Um, we are actually, I think, again, most states are, I know in Michigan we are, we are mandated to report suspected abuse. You know, if we have a child that comes in as a patient, there are obvious signs that we can see. Um, there'll be oral trauma sometimes, different bruising that aren't explained, or you ask the parents, you know, bruising in the eye, you know, things that we would see as a dentist that, you know, our light bulb kind of goes on, you know, what might be going on with this child. And then again, we are mandated to speak up for these. But then as forensic dentists, we can be getting called in as expert witnesses in these cases that testify to the degree of the injury. So what may have caused them? So here's, you know, a very sad situation. I've seen a couple of cases like this. These are all bite marks, you know, so think about the abuse that this, this child is going through. Somebody's biting this child like this. It can be another sibling. It could be a daycare situation. It could be an adult. You know, so as a forensic dentist, we can actually can look at these bite marks and we can sometimes determine, is it a child, is it an adult, or we can narrow down the suspects depending on, on the teeth. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do. I often say, though, we can be the voice for these kids. You know, these kids are so young, they don't have a voice. They can't speak up and explain what may have happened, but we may be able to help be that voice for them and be able to speak up and help determine you know, who's doing it and remove them from that situation. So, again, a very important role that we can do an expert witness. Uh, adult abuse, and it happens, you know, spousal abuse, you know, it can be elderly abuse, we see that too, you know, but same thing, you could have a patient come into you know, your, your office, your practice, you know, you see some sort of bruising or injury that just doesn't make sense to what they explain it, you know, and it does unfortunately happen, so, and just other areas where we can use our experience to help, help these victims, and very huge. And some elderly abuse, you know, can you imagine, you know, I, these pictures come from, there's not from my cases actually come from the ABFO. They supply these for some of these presentations. I don't know the exact background of these cases, but you know, you, you see like this, you know, that just, you just got to pull on your heart, you know? So if you saw this person in your, in your clinic and they came in looking like this, you're going to be asking, well, what happened to you? You know, and, and maybe this person might whisper you, you know, my son did this to me. You know, that's, that the son or somebody isn't around, you know, you, you might be the only person that this victim has seen and they're reaching out for help, you know, so you have to be able to be prepared and, and know what to do to help these people out. So bite mark analysis, um, that's a, an interesting, I guess, field of our, you know, of our work that we can do as well, too. It's very um, I guess highly contested right now, um, if you heard any of it, but there's a, a lot of old cases historically that were done that have been overturned. And you know, it's another subject can be a, a lot of talking about. Um, but I still feel there's can be a lot of value that we can do, you know, depending on the case. But it, you know, if you guys you know, look at this, I think even to you know, the lay person's eye, you could pretty well see that you know, teeth you know, made this type of a mark. You see the individual marks of the teeth, 
You can see the arches, you know, same thing here. This is what we do for an analysis. We do what's called an overlay. So what we'll do is we'll take uh, potential suspects teeth and we analyze them, we digitize them, we put them into Photoshop and we actually can build these overlays and do comparisons and see, you know, do the teeth line up? Could that person have, have made the mark? Um, whenever we do these cases though, as we do in the court of law, we always, you know, approach it as somebody's innocent until proven guilty. So what we do is we always look to exclude. If I have a group of suspects, I'm doing comparisons here. I'm trying to find, you know, what can I use to exclude that person? What can I do to, to prove that person didn't do it? Because I'm going to remove them from the suspect pool. And a lot of cases, we're able to remove a couple and, and reduce the suspect pool down to, you know, a couple of people. And then law enforcement or investigators can take over from there. So in the U.S., there's one of the first bike mark cases was actually back in 1954 in Texas. It was actually a bite mark into cheese. This isn't an actual piece of cheese, just a representation, but the mark was actually used to help identify, I believe, like a robbery or breaking and entering suspect. Um, Florida, 1979, Ted Bundy, you know, one that's very well publicized. I'm sure everybody has heard his name. Um, you see in the picture here, he had some pretty messed up teeth and he left a bite mark on, you know, the buttocks of one of his victims. And so that was a key piece of evidence in his trial. Um, I do actually know the forensic dentist who was involved in that case. So pretty interesting to hear some of the things that happened and how it all, all worked out. So again, just another example of a bite mark here. You can see some teeth. You know, and what we do is we take models of the suspect, we scan them, we scan them with rulers, you know, so we can you know, know how large the teeth are, how big the arch is. And we also always want a ruler in the bite mark itself. So then we actually can do a comparison and line things up and do an analysis. And so things we look for, the shape of teeth, missing teeth, gaps in teeth, you know, all kinds of things that can help you know, exclude a potential suspect from being, being the biter. Okay. And so these are the three conclusions that we come to. We can exclude a suspect. We cannot exclude a suspect. And when it can be inconclusive, sometimes we just can't tell. Um, very rarely now will we actually be able to say that a, a particular person did the bite, you know, to be able to narrow it down. And there's a lot of a lot of reasons for that. One is that skin is just not a good impression. You know, skin moves, you know, skin, you know, if you take a bite and you move your arm different direction, that pattern on the injury is going to move with it as well too, you know, so it's just not a good representation. So there are definitely some limitations to bite marker analysis, but again, it can be used a lot of times to help exclude and help give some guidance to the uh, investigators. Civil litigation, again, you know, cases that we see standard of care, um, malpractice, here's an interesting x-ray. Uh, and again, you guys are, are you know, probably not learning much of this yet, maybe exposed to it, but these are implants and you can see all the different angles these are. And from my understanding, this is actually a real case that some dentists did, but this is definitely malpractice. I mean, you don't place implants like this and point in all different directions. So you know, that's where we can, you know, can be called into you know, care to be able to talk about that. Personal injury, you know, we call it a misadventure sometimes. If what you're doing, your root canal or extraction in somebody and the result is this, you know, this type of trauma to a person, you know, did the dentist do something negligent, you know, do something incorrectly, you know, that shouldn't have been done? Did they breach the standard of care? You know, should there be some sort of, you know, compensation to the patient because of what has happened? Dental fraud, hear about Medicaid fraud, you know, where dentists will charge for fillings they didn't do, you know, cases like that as well. So disaster victim identification, um, that's where we get involved in, like with D Mort and my Mort, where we have mass fatality incidents where we get called in. Um, one of the first known ones where dental was actually used was the, the Paris Bazaar in 1897. It was actually a big bazaar gathering of people and there was a huge fire. And a lot of people died and that 126 people were killed. But there was one dentist in town um, that actually had worked on a lot of the people that died in the fire. And he was actually able to visually just look at the victims and recognize his work. And he knew which you know, person he'd done the work on. So he had did the identification by the means. So one of the first you know, cases that we know of where the dentist did the identifications. Um, more recently, this was nearly 100 see. medical examiners. From oh, this is just some training that we did. I'm going to skip that one too. So gathered in there we go. So disaster mortuary operational response team. Um, this is again, the federal team, which I've been involved on for quite some period of time. Um, I was involved in the response to the Joplin tornado. And I will play this here, this video here for the tornado. If, if you, you might not uh, remember what happened in that tornado. Yeah. The deadliest tornado of the 21st century and the seventh deadliest in U.S. history struck only three years ago. 
Joplin, Missouri witnessed the EF5 multi-vortex tornado on the second day of a six day long severe weather outbreak. It was a hot, humid Sunday afternoon across the middle of the country. In the morning, the Storm Prediction Center issued a moderate risk of severe weather stretching from northeast Oklahoma into Wisconsin. Low pressure centered over South Dakota and a cold front ahead of it were pushing east. This would serve as the starting point for thunderstorm development. A little after 5.30 local time, a tornado had formed southwest of Joplin. From there, it traveled east-northeast into the southern side of the city. This is where the tornado was most intense and the most deadly. In all, the tornado was on the ground for 38 minutes, traveling 22 miles. In less than an hour, more than 1,000 were injured and 158 people lost their lives. There hadn't been a storm this deadly in more than 60 years. For Storm Shield, I'm meteorologist Jason Myers. All right, so 2011, that tornado occurred. Um, I was flown in there as part of the DMART team, I think about three days after to work in the Morgan identifications. I think I said 158 people. I think they attributed a couple more deaths after some of those numbers came out. Um, I want to say we worked on about 176 different remains. And the reason for the difference in numbers is an event like that, much like a plane crash, sometimes the victims are dismembered. You know, so you'll find different pieces of somebody, not always a whole body. You know, they might find an arm or a leg or something as well, too. And that all comes into the morgue and it's considered an individual set of remains because we don't know exactly, you know, where they, you know, who they may have come from. Um, so the EF5, this is an actual picture I took. Um, we were able to tour around the, the, you know, ground zero, if you would. You know, so this is a, a wooden you know, piece of wood, two by four or something, you know, pierced through a concrete curb, you know, so if you can imagine the strength of the winds in that tornado to be able to do damage like that. Um, here's a semi truck wrapped around a tree. This is the, the rails, the frame rails, the semi truck. So the tires are back here and the curbs completely, sorry, the cab is completely around the other side of it. You know, so again, just the amount of force that happens in this size of a tornado, you can imagine what it does to the bodies, you know, where they would come in and into the morgue. So this is the morgue as we is set up into a warehouse. It's set up in a different sections. We have you know odontology section. We have DNA section, personal effects. You know everything is done. So they come in um, and they come in. This is our station for dental. We'd have two tables set up. We have a team of three people that does a dental autopsy together. And these are the, the steel gurneys that the bodies are, are brought through the morgue on. And everybody's treated with respect, all the remains. So when a remain comes in, that's assigned, of course, a number, but it's also assigned that we we'll call a tracker. So a person that's assigned to that remains, and that person stays with that remains as it goes through the morgue. So actually we'll take them from station to station, you know, and treat them with respect and dignity as we go through this process and, and hopefully help identify them. And when the remains are done, then they're stored in refrigerated trucks. And once you know, identification hopefully is made, then they're released to the family and to the funeral homes for you know the processing and, and their burials or whatever they do. Um, here's a picture of the refrigerated trucks where they were stored until they were processed or picked up after identification. So again, we hate to see it happen, but you know, it's a neat use of our skills to be able to do it. And this is, I didn't take this picture as given to me. You know, again, I was, I can't verify if it's legit, but you see other pieces of things embedded here in this concrete, but supposedly, you know, this is a chair embedded in the side of, you know, concrete wall at the hospital. Again, just representing the amount of force that these tornadoes can, can exert. Pretty interesting stuff. Um, here's some other pictures. This was a dental office we discovered and we, we were able to determine that because we found dental x-ray units within the rubble as we we're walking around it's down by the hospital area. And here's the old dental x-ray head. The difficulty this posed for us is because it went through kind of the hospital area. That's where a lot of the dental offices were as well. So some of the offices we were trying to contact to get their anti-mortem records, you know, from the potential victims, the records were destroyed too. Um, you know, then this was still quite a bit of paper records. Now, I know we are all, all fully digital. And so we actually have everything stored up and backed up, you know, in hard drives. So if, you know, heaven forbid that something would happen to my office, you know, we would hopefully be able to get a digital copy of everything. We could use the records, you know, to help for any need identifications or just to continue our work, but that uh, doesn't always happen. So what's the role of the dental office? And as you guys you know, move forward again in your careers, you know, there's different things that we like to teach dentists that can help in case of identification. One is to have good charts. 
Now, these days we use computerized charts a lot. Again, it's very easy for us to look at and determine which teeth had what work to be able to do in our analysis. Um, handwritten charts, this is a beautiful example of a handwritten chart. I don't know too many dentists I actually took the time to draw work like this, but we see it. Um, more than often, this is what we see, you know, chicken scratch, you know, it's hard to decipher this handwriting, you know, people use different abbreviations, you know, and like this, like, hey, we're just trying to decipher this code. You know, we have sometimes call a dentist, you know, what did you do here? What does this mean? So more and often, this is the charts that we would see, and it just makes it really hard for identification. Um, X-rays, this was actually from Hurricane Katrina, you know, again, so much flooding, disaster by water, dental offices were swamped, you know, so this is the, what the X-rays they found. You know, can we use them to do a comparison? You know, there were people that took these x-rays apart and tried to salvage them, you know, and do the best they could to try and get the information that we could use on identification. It's pretty tough. Um, we always like to see original radiographs whenever we can, but sometimes that's what the originals look like. Uh, HIPAA is always a big question that a lot of dentists will ask, you know, if because HIPAA is there as a health and um, insurance portability accountability act. Um, sorry, and I think I said that right. And basically it protects the patient's records, the data, you know, that you just can't share information with just anybody. Um, but if law enforcement comes to the office and they say, if we need the records for identification and something happens, we've had some dentists who were hesitant to give us those records because of this, but there's actually a clause within HIPAA that says that dentists are able to release those records without consent from the victim or the victim's family if it's needed for an investigation. So we have had some times where we actually had to send law enforcement to a dental office to physically get the records. Not always fun to do, but majority of dentists, if we call them up, they will gladly send them to us via email or, or through the mail as well too. But sometimes it makes it a little harder to do. So I just like to finish up sometime my presentations with this, because I think it says a lot about our culture and society, but show me the manner in which a nation cares for its dead and I will measure with mathematical exactness the tender sympathies of its people, the respect for the law and the land and the loyalty to high ideals. So that's um, pretty, pretty says a lot, I think right there again, how we go through such great extents to be able to identify the victims of these, these terrible accidents that happen where he's look at other countries, you know, they don't always have the means to do it, but sometimes it's just not in their culture to do it as well too. But I think it really says a lot. All right, so I think that's gonna be the end for, you know, my presentation there. Some guys are just terribly excited. You know, hopefully I you know, gave you a, you know, a little example of what forensic dentistry is a lot. I know I kind of threw a lot there out, out at you, but you know, as you move on in your dental career, just knowing there are other areas that you can use your experience and your knowledge as you're gaining this, you know, rather than just doing, you know, just dentistry, day-to-day -day dentistry. You know, I love being a dental dentist. You know, I do root canals, I do implants, you know, I do the whole you know, scheme of services for my patients. I love doing it, but this is a, another neat, neat way again to help people and to use my skills. So I guess if there's any any questions that we can uh, get, guess give to me now. Yep, thank you so much for that lovely um, presentation. You're welcome. There are some questions in the live chat. So there's someone asking, are there certain conditions that lend themselves to be better or worse preserved teeth? So are there certain conditions that preserve teeth better than others? I'd say, you know, most of the time, you know, if there's even trauma, the teeth again are so hard, they hold up really well. You know, if it's a decomposition, we find like in Canada right now, yeah, it happens on here too, but I see a lot in like Northern Canada because we service the entire province, but people go missing in the winter time. And because of the ice and the cold, you know, they don't go searching for them. They presume to be dead. And when things thaw in the springtime, they find the bodies. So we'll get those bodies. And again, the body might be in pretty bad decomposition, but the teeth are, are solid and intact. Um, we've had mummified victims and people that die like in a house and, you know, haven't found for months later. It's pretty sad, but you know, they're still in very good shape. Um, the only thing that we'll see if a really, really bad fire. So sometimes like an automobile accident. So if it's, there's a lot of petroleum products and a lot of plastic, like in a car, gasoline, you know, if that fire burns hot and long enough for a longer period of time, the teeth can be ultimately damaged. Um, they're usually one of the last things that are damaged, but they can be. But also in cremation, you know, so when people are cremated, um, you know, intentionally, you know, for cremation, you know, I'm not people, people know, but when you're done being cremated, your bones and teeth are actually still relatively intact. They're what we call calcined. So all of the organic materials out of it, it's just kind of like calcium. They're brittle, 
But you know, when you see ashes of people from cremation, people don't always know that they put that through basically a grinder. So they take what's left, they burn off all the organic debris, your bones and stuff are brittle enough, they put it in a grinder and that's what creates the actual dust. So even in a cremation, sometimes the teeth will survive and, you know, and be relatively intact, it has to be handled with care, but yeah. I actually never knew that it was actually ground up. Yeah, yeah, that's why it becomes such fine dust, yes. Mm -hmm. Someone else is asking, how can you identify an individual based on composite filling? Would that be more difficult to decipher since they blend in with the tooth color? I think you mentioned it a little yep. bit with the UV light. Yeah, yep. but it is a yeah, very good question because modern dentistry is very good. You know, we first glance sometimes don't see some fillings, but all of our autopsies, dental autopsies, we use the UV light to help highlight any potential fillings that we're not seeing just visually. So that is one thing. We actually have had some cases where people have been identified by the actual filling material. And so going back to the dental charts, you know, in my charts, since I'm a forensic dentist, I do this, but I write down the actual brand of material that we put in the tooth because we have had some where we found like one or two teeth of somebody. We've gotten the records and the records said this is the material that was put into the tooth. We actually can do electron scanning microscope or other types of things to look at that material, look closely at it, determine the chemical composition of the material. And we've done identifications because we knew, hey, this doctor used XYZ brand of material. That's what's in the tooth. And we're able to say that was a positive identification. So yeah, so even beyond just visually, we actually can chemically study the composition. That's very interesting. It is. So yeah, good question. Mm, someone else is asking, you mentioned that the U.S. has most of the forensic odontologists in the world. Uh, do you think this means the U.S. is more advanced in this field? Um, I would say it's more advanced because I do have a lot of international you know, colleagues in forensic dentistry and, and, and they're all very well advanced. You know, there are some countries that you know, don't have the means as much, but it's more just because it's the American Board of Forensic Odontology, I would say. You know, it, it's, it's here in the United States, you know, but we have had some international people who have gone through the process. Uh, but there are definitely forensic experts you know, around the world. There's a lot of them out there. Um, you know, they have very good credentials, have a lot of experience, a lot of studying at different organizations. But just with the ABFO, that's just a number of people that have gone through that process. Yeah. Okay. So someone else is asking, do you have any suggested reads for us as pre-dental students that are highly interested in this field? There's a couple of resources, the, the ABFO website, abfo.org, um, it does have some information. There's also another organization called the American Society of Forensic Odontology, asfo.org. Um, and so they also have, that's more entry level for people who are forensic dentists, but don't necessarily want to become board certified. There's some resources on there as well, too. Uh, the University of Tennessee has a program, a fellowship program as well on there. I don't know their actual website address for that, but there's other you know, resources there. Um, and there are some manuals out there. The ASFO, we have a manual that we produce that has you know, a, a lot of explanation about forensic dentistry. So going to some of those websites, then they have good links and resources and other materials. So you know, even just looking at some of the webinars you know, like this, there's webinars out there in forensic dentistry. So as you get into your, your career you know, as a dentist and you do want to pursue forensic dentistry, that'd be great. Um, I also recommend a good entry starting point is being on the state teams, like me being on my more, the state of Michigan team. Um, majority of the states in the United States have their own state team. Um, and there's very, not a lot of, I guess, criteria to be on that state, that state team, other than just be willing to go to disasters and work in these conditions. So it's a great way to get involved as well, too. Okay. And how does this job affect you and your mental health on a long-term scale? Right. And that's, how do you maintain your normal life? Right. That's it can be hard. You know, that's a very good question as well, too. And not everybody is cut out for this. Um, myself and other people I know, we have these discussions sometimes, of course, you know, it's it can be emotional taxing depending on what's going on. But try and focus on what we're doing, the positive thing that we're doing. So we're I'm in the morgue, you know, I, I see remains. Death has never bothered me. You go to dental school, you'll you know do you know gross anatomy. You'll work on remains as you learn the anatomy. You know, so you'll be exposed to it, but it never has really bothered me. Um, but cases like children, those are the hard ones. You know, I had one case where is an Amish. There's the Amish community in the area 
the Amish buggy was hit by a drunk driver and two of the children were killed on impact. And I had to identify, you know, which child is which and, you know, see these young kids, you know, just barely have any life, you know, to them, you know, and then they're, they're ripped out of this world and here they are in front of me. And, and those are the harder ones and sometimes, but again, I focus on, I'm here to help the family, help her that we you know, get the right child, the, the right name, and then they can give back to their loved ones. I had uh, that car accident one I referenced before. It was a two teenage girls that were out driving down um, you know, back roads going too fast in a the car. They shouldn't have been, and they lost control and hit a tree and some pretty traumatic injuries to them. And I was called down to the morgue and I did the autopsies, didn't pay a whole lot of you know attention to it, just you know focused on my job. When I got home that evening, I turned on the news and there were the pictures of these two young girls and their family talking about them. So, you know, you see that it hurt, you know, it does hurt, you know, you know, he, I just saw, you know, these, these families, loved ones in the morgue, you know, so it can be hard, but again, it just, you have to focus on what you're doing. Yeah, totally. It seems yeah. rough. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is not for everybody. You know, it isn't, you know. Um, someone else is asking, is this field of dentistry covered as part of the specialties that dental students are exposed to in their third and fourth year of dental school? So is it integrated in the curriculum in any way? Depends on the school. It, it really does. Um, it's not a recognized specialty like through the ADA. It's not actual specialty as say periodontics is, you know, as oral surgery, endodontics, those specialties, um, even though we you know, do have a certification organization. Um, I know at Michigan, that's one of the things that exposed me to it. Dr. Gobetti at the time, one of our instructors did a, a, you know, a one afternoon lecture on forensic dentistry. So I do know some of the schools will have a minimal exposure to it, um, but it's not a really a huge part of the curriculum as far as I know, majority of schools. Um, so I guess this kind of relates to the last question. Uh -huh. Someone else is asking, um, how can we as pre-dentals be more involved in odontology? Are there any shadowing or internship opportunities? Um, that would be a really good, I know there's like shadowing, of course, in regular dental offices, but, you know, going down to the morgue is, you know, can be pretty sensitive sometimes just because of the nature of what we do. Um, so I, I don't know, at least in the morgue here in Kalamazoo or even in Montreal, you know, we do have interns and fellows that come in, but usually they're further along in the dental career or a forensic anthropology career. So usually I think most of the time any exposure to that, it's going to be further along in the career just because, I mean, not that anybody would, but it does happen. We don't want somebody who say, oh, I'm interested in just because they want to get into morgue and see dead people, you know? So we, we want to make sure that, you know, people who, who want to be exposed to this really have already shown the career path of being in the dental field and the forensic odontology. So yeah, that can be tough. It's a good question, but yeah, I, I think at this probably state of the game, there isn't a whole lot of exposure for really handy hands-on stuff. It's more probably just, you know, shadowing like this and webinars and other kind of courses that you might be able to expose to or be able to find, you know, but you know, always can be, can reach out, you know, there's myself, you know, I'm happy to share, you know, my email address. Um, I don't know if you can put it up somewhere, you're welcome to um, draft DDS. So D R A S ftdds at gmail.com. Yeah, you know, I'm happy to talk and share stuff. You know, again, I love to teach and share my experiences. So, and not all you know people are, but yeah, I'm very approachable and would love the opportunity if somebody is really interested and wants to learn more. Yeah, for sure. Maybe we can put your email at the description yeah. box below so people yep. can reference that in the future. Be fine. Um, and last question from the live chat: What was your fellowship at UT like? Was it right after dental school or sometime after you graduated? Yeah, a majority of people going to forensic dentistry have already had a pretty well-established dental career. Um, the average age of the friend of the board certified forensic dentist, well, I can't remember, but I think it's in the 60s, you know, so, so most of them are older because it takes a lot of commitment, you know, to be able to go do a fellowship, so take time other practice. So usually when you get out of school, you got a lot of debt, you know, you need to pay off the bills, you need, if you're going to buy a practice, pay that bill off having families, you know, your lives are busy. And so in order to dedicate to being board certified, it takes quite a significant commitment. They say on average, it takes people between five to 10 years to go through the certification process. And a lot of that is getting the cases. So you have to have so many cases, so many identification cases, so many bike mark cases, testimony cases, before you even can attempt the boards. 
And once you meet that prerequisite of cases, you know, then you have, you know, basically a year long worth of taking boards. You have, um, you know, boards we do online, computerized board examinations. We do written board examinations. And finally, we, you know, close all up with actually a live board, you know, in front of people, you know, board examination, you know, discussing cases and kind of being put in the hot seat, so to speak. So it's quite the process to go through. Um, myself and Corinne, um, we were very fortunate. We did it in under five years, but we also got affiliated with metal examiners where we got the cases. So that's where I started working at Kalamazoo County and they were really nice to me and give me the cases. And so I was able to really go through that process more quickly than, than some people. So, so it takes a lot of work, but that's why it's usually people who have already been, you know, at a dentist for some period of time. But one step back, that's right. Why, why I tell people, you know, if you're interested to get on those state teams, because there's not a lot of requirements to be on the state team. So you can get in and I know Michigan and we do annual training. So you get some training there, you meet, you network. Um, there's also the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. That's another uh, resource, aafs.org. They have annual meetings every year as well too. And that's not just forensic dentistry. It's actually all forensic sciences that come together for an annual meeting. Um, so another place they meet people and network and learn more. Yeah, so there are opportunities. Yeah, thank you for that resource. Um, yeah. Just two questions that we like to ask all uh -huh. the dentists that come to uh, do sessions with us. So one is a question about COVID-19. So do you think COVID has impacted your career in any way this year? It, it greatly has um, in many ways. You know, one was the shutdown, you know, both here in Canada, both the offices I work at, um, you know, we, there are four months that we weren't operating. Um, coming back online, you know, we had a shortage of PPE. That was the biggest thing. And, you know, adjusting our methods and protocols to be able to adjust for the requirements that were you know, given to us for COVID. And, you know, there's like, you know, we normally in my office here in Michigan, we run three hygienists all day long. Um, but because of the constraints of cleaning the rooms, letting the air settle and using air purifiers and those things, we could only do two rooms because we had to use one room as a letting the room kind of sit and settle down and rotate through. So, you know, we saw a pretty significant reduction in our hygiene production and therefore the doctor production. So, yeah, it, it was pretty hard financially on the office. We were able to get PPP loans, which was great. Some other financial you know, need that actually helped to get us through to be able to pay the staff, the salaries and stuff and be able to take care of it. Um, that's one thing is me as being a, a dentist, a practice owner, I really take heavy on myself is taking care of my employees. You know, I do see them as a family. They're very important to me. They're very important to my livelihood as far as I am to them, you know, so I need to make sure that I've got these people that work hard and they dedicate their career towards, you know, my practice and I want to take care of them, you know, so we were able to really take care of a lot of our staff and make sure that they were getting paychecks, getting paid through that time. So, so that was really important. Um, you know, now it's more, we're catching back up again, getting back up to speed. It's a backlog. That's my biggest complaint. I hear from patients all the time complaining about how long it's taken to get back in and, you know, it's out of our control. It's just the reality of the way this past year was, but, you know, people have had to wait longer to get stuff taken care of. You know, we may have had a person that had a cavity diagnosis before COVID. We're getting them back in six months later now, and the cavity's gotten bigger. Now they need a root canal. You know, they may not have needed a root canal before. It would have been just a filling, but now, unfortunately, because of the COVID and the time, you know, now they need a root canal. So it's, it's unfortunate to see that happen. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And so the last finishing question that we always finish our sessions off with is if you can go back in time and mm -hmm. tell yourself what you know now, what would you tell yourself? So when you're applying to dental school or mm -hmm. when you're doing undergrad or not? I would, I would say to me, you're doing the right thing. You know, it, it's, I, I feel very fortunate that I, from early in high school, I knew I wanted to be a dentist. And a lot of that was from my family. My mom was a dental assistant who exposed me to it. And, and you know, some other things in my life that kind of point in that direction. And I, and I love it. I love being a dentist. I love what I do every day. I think it's very fortunate that I can say that and everybody loves that about their lives and their careers. Um, there are some days where I, hey, I, I stayed up too late. I'm too tired. And, you know, I, I, I say this when I talk to people about it, that, you know, I, rather sleep in or something, but I've never dreaded going to the office. So if I were to go back, you know, I, I feel at least in my life, I'm very happy with the career path. I'm very happy with the things I've done. And I would say, Hey, you know, you've, you've got it right. You're doing, you know, what's going to make you happy and give you a really fun life. So, so go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I just say to anybody you've, you know, make sure it is your passion. You know, it's to me, dentistry has never been about the money. 
you know, I think if you do good quality, quality dentistry, you take care of patients the right way, that will happen. You know, you know, I've been able to afford some nice things in life because of my dentistry, but that was never the main reason. You know, so to me, it's about the people taking care of the people, you know, so I think if you approach it right and you enjoy what you do, it's going to be an amazing career, you know, to see the effect that you can have on lives, the things you can do, get people out of pain. That's why I love doing implants, giving patients back teeth. You know, I've had such satisfaction doing implants and giving people teeth back again, making them so happy. And so to me, that's been very rewarding. So I had to say, I'd look back and give myself, you know, I don't want to sound my head too big, but give myself a, you know, a pat on the back, say, you know what, you're really doing a cool thing. Yeah. That's amazing, honestly. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, I I get, I love it. It's very, as you can tell, very passionate about it. It's been, been a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, that concludes our session for today. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Draft for joining us. And thank you so much, you guys for joining our live session. I know it was a little late, but as always, the quiz will be in the description and Uh, Have a great evening. All right. Thank you very much. Good luck, everybody.